Good morning. It is so good to see you this morning as we come together to worship an awesome and a loving God. So thankful for your presence today. So thankful to be here to give God our praise and our thanksgiving. If you haven't already done so, I'll ask you to take just a moment to fill out the registration of attendance. You'll find that in the registration pad in the pew right in front of you. Just take a moment to fill out the information that is requested and pass it down the pew so that others may do the same. And as is our custom, we'll turn that into a ritual of friendship by passing it back in its original direction and just taking note of the names of those who you are worshiping with. So please, if you haven't already done so, take just a moment to do that. You'll see on the back of your bulletin this week's opportunities uh, within the congregation and the life of the membership. Just a couple of things that I want to lift up for you. You'll see all of the week's activities posted there. But just a reminder that next Sunday, July 29th, will be our fifth Sunday of combined worship with Sunday school starting at 9 o'clock and a combined worship service here in the sanctuary at 10 15. So it's going to be a great Sunday of music and God's Word. So make plans for that and adjust your schedules accordingly for that fifth Sunday service. You'll also see why Wednesday is coming up this Wednesday. You have until the end of the day tomorrow to sign up kids who have completed kindergarten or fifth grade. And what a great opportunity to go skating and for pizza. You just can't ask for anything better than that for a kid. That'd be a great time, great fun. As well as the Grizzlies basketball camp, you'll see information about that posted there as well. And also give you an invitation to come and, and join in the ministry and the mission of the church. Uh, Perry is looking for volunteers to help with Project Transformation, one of the great uh, causes and, and uh, mission ministries in this annual conference. So if you are interested, please give Perry uh, a shout out. He'd love to hear from you. And a lot of different ways that you can help with Project Transformation on a couple of different days throughout the week. So please, if God is stirring your heart to do something to help, particularly in, in promoting literacy among our youth in this city, great opportunity. So come and join uh, Perry for that great occasion and admissions opportunity. You'll also see on the back of your bulletin uh, those joys and concerns within our membership. The flowers from the pulpit are given to the glory of God and in memory of Bob Gary for his birthday on July 24th, given uh, from the Seekers class and celebrate that memory of Bob Gary. Also, the flowers of the collector are given to the glory of God and in honor of Stella Gill for her 21st birthday on the 24th as well, given with love of mom, dad, and mother. So we celebrate Stella's birthday. 21st, that's a milestone birthday, so congratulations to Stella. You'll see those who are listed in the hospital, uh, several changes there. Russell Palmer has been discharged from King's Daughters and Son and has gone to the Baptist Rehab Facility. So we want to continue to be in prayer for Russell as he continues to go through rehab and improve in health. And we have two of our congregation members who are in the hospital that are not listed. We want to keep in our thoughts and prayers Bonnie Weir, who is at Baptist East, and Ed Garvey, who is at Germantown Methodist. So we want to keep all of them in our thoughts and prayers uh, throughout this week and in the days ahead, certainly. Also, as a community of faith, as a Christian family, we again express our Christian sympathy to the family of Jane Keller upon her death this past week, and certainly want to remember uh, her sons and, and family uh, as they go through this process of, of grieving and, uh, but also celebrating a great life and a life that now has gone on to the church eternal. So remember uh, Jane Keller's family and your thoughts and prayers throughout this week. That concludes our announcements for today, so let's now prepare our hearts and our minds. For you.
you are invited to stand in body or spirit as we join together in our call to worship. We are aliens and sojourners in this world, but God invites us to be God's guests. God lavishly offers hospitality and love welcomes us into God's name. We come to God in this day, the one who names each of us as a beloved child. Here in these moments together, may we recognize God's dwelling from love and in us. Now let us join together in our opening hymn of praise, number 540, I Love Thy Kingdom. Receive up these joys, receive up these concerns, 
that you would look upon us, bless us as you bless them. God, that we would be able to turn to you in full confidence and trust in the perfection of your timing and of your will. God, we are grateful for the opportunity to pause and to pray. For you call your house a house of prayer for all nations. So it is indeed a gift to be able to gather ourselves together of one heart and one mind in this day, and to turn ourselves toward you, to listen for a word from you, and to make known to you those things that cause us to celebrate as well as those things that cause us anxiety things that cause us to feel fearful and concerned. God, all of these things we live to you, all of these things we entrust to you because we know that you hear us as we pray. So we ask, oh God, that whatever is written on these cards, whatever names are there, whatever needs are there, oh God, whatever things are written on our hearts, whatever names or needs are there, that you would know, that you would help us to turn those things over to you with full confidence, and the sufficiency of your grace and the all-encompassing nature of your perfect will. These things we pray in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus who taught his disciples how to pray. And so with the confidence of your children, we join our voices, the voices of those first disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. The Old Testament reading is from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 6, verse 1 through 14 a. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the word had given him rest from all of his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. That same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to check shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and I have cut off all of your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled, and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you. You shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. You shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. The epistle reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. So then, remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision, by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, and he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, 
thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death the hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you will also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you both for the reading of God's Word. We now invite the children to come up to the chancel area for the children's message with Sherry. more than we would ever be able 
thinking about ourselves. And so anytime you go to measure something to cook with, or measure something to cut with the help of your parents, with a tape measure, or you're looking at your watch, just remember that none of those ways are ever going to help you measure how much God loves you. Because he loves you even more than that. Will you all pray with me today? And I'm going to use um, some words right from his book today, from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 17 through 19 in our prayer this morning. So I say, dear God, thank you so much for giving us everything that we need, everything that we want, and everything that we can ever imagine. Thank you so much for your undying love. And I close with your words that say, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Amen. The congregation said to his children, children are such a blessing and they're so smart. I'm so thankful. Thank all you ladies for that wonderful message. We are indeed a blessed community of faith and God has given us much. And now we have the opportunity to give back to God through his tithes and our hearts.
Most loving and gracious God, we are so thankful for the many ways that you have blessed us and for the many ways that you have provided for us. And we are thankful for the opportunity to give back to you the Lord a portion of those gifts. We ask that you take this offering, that you multiply and use it to the Lord, so that you may be made known and your very kingdom may be advanced. We pray all these things in your Son, most holy name. Amen. Good morning. I'd like to uh, invite you all to lift your voices in praise as we sing this next hymn, number 188. Uh, but before we do, uh, just looking at this, uh, I, I draw your attention to verse 2. It says, Christ is the world's peace, Christ and none other. No one can serve him and despise another. Who else unites us? One in God the Father. Such a beautiful thing. You think about all of these things that unify us, that bring us together. Uh, whether that's where we're from or what we believe. Uh, often it's uh, where we went to college even. But to have a, a Savior that unites us in love and in peace is a beautiful thing. Christ is the world's light.
When they had crossed over, they came to land in Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, or cities, or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched him were healed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. June 26, 2015. Off the top of their head, does anyone know that day? It was an historic day for the United States of America. In an important move, the Supreme Court declared that marriage is a constitutional right for all Americans, regardless of sexual orientation. Essentially, this made marriage of persons in the LGBT community legal in every state, as opposed to the 37 states where it had been legal before. And it made our nation just one of a growing number where such is the law of the land. Now, this ruling, if you will remember, obviously caused some people to rejoice. But it also had a number of folks up and on, out of concern for what they thought might happen to our nation, what might happen to the, the concept of family, to a certain definition, traditional value. But in my mind, as odd as it may sound, the result of the court's decision on that day, as monumental as it was, and as monumental as it continues to be, that's not the most pertinent issue. Because from where I stand, the more, I guess you'd say, problematic aspect of the whole thing was the behavior. The behavior of people on every side of the conversation. The behavior of people on every side of the map. Perhaps you can recall the vitriol that came in the wake of the ruling. The acrimony that still exists in a number of ways. Those who were supportive of the ruling, belittling those who weren't. Those who weren't supportive, <coughs> slandering those who were. But most disturbing to me, as a person of faith, was those persons professing faith, especially a Christian faith, assuming a posture of, of suspicion, of, of, of accusation, of vilification toward those who held an opposing or a variant view. Those who were supportive of the ruling seem to want to say that, that God's love extends to everyone. And, and that all people should be treated equally. But those who stood against the ruling tended to see the bigger question being one of, of sin or, or violating God's will. In short, the ruling led to a whole lot of division. Led to a whole lot of hostility. The ripples of which we still see within the body of Christ, between denominations, among congregations, and even within families. And yet, the sad truth is, that kind of hostility existed well before that particular decision. Weeks before that ruling, for instance, you may remember, our annual conference narrowly passed a resolution asking United Methodists 
simply to engage in conversation. Simply asking us to dialogue about how we can best be in ministry to and with persons of the LGBT community. And just that, just the admonition to talk led to some pretty heated debate. And it showed up in some form at every annual conference since. Even so, and, and, and this is where I'm going this morning, even so, disagreements do not exist only around this one topic. That's just a single area. That's just a single issue, a single conversation. And we're foolish to think that disagreements exist only there. Because we Christians, we Christians tend to squabble and quibble over just about everything. From points of doctrine to styles of worship to where we place the poinsettias at Christmas. <coughs> and make no mistake, these things are important. They matter. Even if they don't matter to us, they matter to someone. And still, the most important thing, the most important thing is Christ's reminder that we will be known as his followers by our love for one another. That's the only thing that identifies us. Not where we stand on a particular issue. Not who we voted for in the last election. Not whether we are right on this matter or that. Christ said that the only thing that defines us is our love for one another. But we are usually far more comfortable castigating and criticizing those who don't see or say or do stuff the way we do. Jumping to conclusions and, and, and piecing together generalizations, we're much more comfortable doing that than we are in engaging in the truly difficult and the often messy work of holy listening, of carefully and respectfully considering other people's perspectives and attempting that we might not be where they are, to at least understand. St. Paul speaks in his letter to the church at Ephesus about a dividing wall. He also says that that wall has been broken down by Christ. Such that hostility between Jewish and Gentile Christians could be put to death. And then elsewhere, the apostle tells us that there is no Jew or Greek. That there is no male or female. There is no slave or free because all are one in Christ Jesus. But here's the question. For the church, do we live as if we believe this? Do we live as if we believe this? Because here's the fact, folks. We don't all look or act like it. We don't. We don't all look or act like And frankly, I believe that's something to be praised. I think it's something to be praised that our Creator has gifted us with beautiful diversity that in every element proclaims the genius of divine design. We don't all look alike, we don't all act alike, but we're not going to agree on everything. We don't all think or, or feel or perceive alike. And that's okay too. Because to be sure, constructive disagreement, it can actually be healthy. Because when we constructively disagree, it challenges us to grow. But whether or not I agree with your opinions, whether you agree with me on every detail, that's far less relevant. 
far less relevant than the gospel's mandate, our Lord's mandate, that we would love one another This means getting rid of hostility in whatever form that it exists. Because, friends, it's hostility that leads to the hatred and the malevolence that we hear about now on the news on an almost daily basis. That comes from hostility. It's hostility that leads to the school shooting. Earlier this year in Parkland, Florida, in Benton, Kentucky, the latter, which was formerly very, very close to home for me, and the dozens of others that have already taken place this year, and we're just about halfway through. It's hostility. It's hostility that leads to tragedies like those a couple years back in, in places like Charleston and Chattanooga. It's hostility that leads to three separate United Methodist Church buildings in my former district being vandalized. It's hostility that leads to anger. It's hostility that leads to violence. It's hostility that leads to war. It's hostility that leads to death. And I am of the mind that there's more than enough of that in the world. It has no place in God's church. No purpose in God's church. And still, it exists, doesn't it? Because we humans, we like to draw lines. We like to create barriers. We like to say what's mine and what's yours. We like to say who's in and who's out, who's with us. Who's with them? We're quite a death. If mine be defended. Less frequently do we consider moving the family. The story is told of a man who lived in World War II Poland, which was largely Roman Catholic at the time. And the man was a very good man. He was honest. He was dependent. He took care of others, putting their needs before his own. He fed beggars. And he housed travelers. He even sheltered those who were fleeing from the mostly corrupt authorities. In short, this man loved his village and he loved its people and they loved him. And they respected him. But it happened one day that this man died. And the townsfolk rallied to prepare for his funeral. And they visited the local priest, who, of course, agreed to, to conduct the service. The only problem, he said, was related to the burial. Because this man wasn't a member of the church. He hadn't been back. And so it was therefore against church law to bury him on church land. Of course, the people protested, saying that this man had taken such good care of so many of them and, and lived more like Christ than most who had been in the congregation for ages. If he didn't deserve to be buried in the church, who did? The priests agreed. That this man was indeed loving and, and kind in an extraordinary measure, but maintained that his hands were tied. So he suggested that as a compromise, they bury the man just the other side of the fence that surrounded the cemetery. That way he would not be on consecrated ground, but would still be near to the church. Reluctant. Everyone agreed. The time came for the funeral, and the body was processed to its resting place. 
The priests performed the necessary rites, and the headstone was placed in the mourner's room. And night fell, and morning came. And as the priest made his way to the church for morning mass, he saw something that froze him in his tracks. Someone, or a group of someone, had come during the night and had moved that fence that surrounded the cemetery to the other side of where the man was buried. He who had been outside was now inside. And friends, I think that this is what it means. I think this is what it looks like to remove hostility. I think it means, I think it looks like breaking down walls. I think it means, I think it looks like when necessary, moving the fence or removing it altogether. Because we are going to hold varying perspectives. We are going to hold varying opinions. We are going to have different understandings of, of what's right and, and of what's wrong, of what's appropriate and what's inappropriate, but to walk in Christ's love and to follow Christ requires opening ourselves to those who may not think or look or act exactly like us. It means opening ourselves to them and making room for them in the same way that God does. Which means, at the very least, that there ought to be room for everybody. The end of the Gospel lesson for today says that all who touch, even the fringe of Christ's cloak or he, not some. As many as reached out for him were made whole. As many as reached out for him were made well. And notice that Jesus didn't stop them as they approached to ask where they came from. Or what their name was. Or where they stood on certain issues. Or, or whether they worshipped in the right place. Or, or where they fell on the political spectrum. Jesus didn't ask who their kin was. Jesus didn't ask to get background checked. All who came were he. This is my question this morning, church. How can we expect people to receive the life of Christ and life from Christ as long as we are saying who can and can't come. How can we expect people to receive the life of Christ and life from Christ as long as we're saying who can and can't come? Christ didn't mind the fence in that way. Why do we? Christ instead tore walls down. Scripture says that he brought near those who had been far off. That he put to death hostility and that he made one new humanity. Isn't it time, dear ones, isn't it time that we stop trying to undo what he did? Isn't it time that we learn to put aside differences or take the truly radical step of learning to celebrate differences? Isn't it time that we drop all of the artificial categories and agree to disagree and embrace one another as brothers and sisters, which, by the way, we are whether we like it or not. It may be optimistic. And it may sound simplistic. But it is my prayer. And I believe that it can happen as we join our Savior and breaking down walls and moving fences. Maybe so. In the name of the Father.
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning, as our response to the word, may we join our voices together in the affirmation of faith that we found in the United Methodist Temple on page 886. Page 886. And this is a responsive affirmation, so I will begin and then we will join our voices together in the words printed in bold, basically. Page 886. Believe in God, creator of the world and of all people, and in Jesus Christ, incarnate among us, who died and rose again, and in the Holy Spirit present with us to guide, strengthen, and comfort. We believe in God, help our unbelief. We rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom, and the upholding of human dignity and community, in every expression of love, justice, and reconciliation, in each act of self-giving on behalf of others, and the abundance of God's gifts entrusted to us that all may have enough, and all responsible use of the earth's resources. Glory be to God on high and on earth peace. We confess our sin, individual and collective, by silence or action, to the violation of human dignity based on race, class, age, sex, nation, or faith, through the exploitation of people because of greed and indifference, through the misuse of power in personal, communal, national, and international life, to the search for security by those military and economic forces that threaten human existence, through the abuse of technology, which endangers the earth and all life upon it. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We commit ourselves individually and as a community to the way of Christ, to take up the cross, to seek abundant life for all humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, to risk ourselves in faith, hope, and love, praying that God's kingdom may come. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. This morning, our closing hymn is on page 545, United Methodist Temple, the church's one foundation. Before we stand and sing together, I would like to offer this invitation to deepening your own discipleship, your own followers of Jesus Christ. It may be that you hear this morning and, and you've never taken the opportunity to, the opportunity to respond to to, to how it is Christ is calling you or to where it is Christ is representing you. If you're here this morning and you have heard that still small voice, which is indeed Christ's voice, through the Holy Spirit beckoning you, I invite you to come, to present yourself and to say, Here I am, Lord, send me. I am yours. Mind, body, soul, and spirit. Or perhaps you're here this morning and, and you need to recommit yourself to Christ. Perhaps you're here this morning and you have wandered aside from the path that Christ placed in front of you and, and you need to come and say, Lord, I, I am here to, to offer myself yet again, to offer myself once more, to offer myself anew to who it is that you're asking me to be and to what it is that you're asking me to be. This invitation is open to you. We'll be here in the chancel to, to pray with you if you to choose to come. But let us now stand and sing our, our closing hymn for this morning, The Church is One Foundation, page 541. <laughs>
conclusion of our worship services each and every week to offer to you the bread, which represents Christ's body, the cup, which represents Christ's blood, to be nourished, to love, to serve in Christ's name. And so, as these communion elements are offered to you, we ask God's blessing over them, saying, God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon this bread and upon this cup, that those who receive them will receive them as the body and blood of Christ being nourished by the same body and blood, that they might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by His blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast of His heavenly baby. This we pray in the holy and blessed name of Christ. Amen. Now, we receive these words of benediction and of blessing. Children of God, go forth in peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.